Welcome back. Uh, we did a wonderful historical and political zigzag around Cuba and America, history, politics, policy, diplomacy yesterday. Today we're going to really drill down on change. Much of the day will be focused on change in Cuba, change in the Cuban diaspora. Um, but we're going to begin with a wonderful guide to change in Cuba politics in the most kind of profoundly political sense. Uh, usually, I, you know, I always get to say I don't need to introduce so-and-so to people. And in this case, I actually don't. I'm standing here watching everybody in the room come up and talk to Jim McGovern, um, anyone who has covered Latin America or human rights or Cuba or any one of a number of issues knows him. In particular, um, many of you in this room have experience going back to his own early work before he was in elective office when he was working for Congressman uh, Joe Moakley, uh, investigating the massacres of Jesuits in El, massacre of Jesuits in El Salvador and otherwise working on those issues. Um, of course, now, we know Jim McGovern as the Democratic Congressman from the Second District of Massachusetts, the great city of Worcester. We know him as a, uh, which I, which I'm, I'm proud to think of myself as sort of a vaguely honorary constituent because my wife's entire family is from Massachusetts, including I'll send you an some, ballot. yeah, <laughs> which I will, I will fill out multiple times. In the best Massachusetts tradition, um, but uh, he, he has a national reputation as a well-deserved as a tireless advocate uh, on the one hand for the nuts and bolts needs of the district and on the other hand as the great champion for human rights, campaign finance reform, social justice, food security. Uh, I, as a writer for The Nation magazine for many years, um, whenever these issues would come up in our editorial meetings or assignment meetings, sooner or later Jim McGovern's name would be sort of floated as someone we need to be in touch with or have someone write about or try to get to write for the magazine. So um, these are issues on which he has really built a reputation of conscience uh, and integrity for many years. Uh, in particular, among his many um, issues that he's focused on and brought that conscience and integrity to is Cuba. Uh, the congressman has been a voice of sanity uh, and calm on uh, Cuba policy, on the embargo, without ever compromising his own perspective on human rights, either within Cuba or the U.S. Um, and we've asked him here today to really talk about whatever he wants to, to a room full of journalists who are going to be thinking hard about their own coverage in the next year or so, a time that maybe will bring significant change in the relationship between these countries. Um, curious to learn your thoughts on this. Um, you can talk for however long you want, and then we'll move to a conversation with the room. Well, thanks, Bruce, for the generous introduction. I, uh, after that buildup, I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, I, and, and I know most of the people in this room, and you know more about Cuba than I do, uh, most of you. So, um, uh, so I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, the congressional perspective uh, in Cuba as it relates to the United States Congress. And kind of by way of background, you know, I've, 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 been, I've been fascinated with Cuba for as long as I can remember. Um, and, um, you know, I, I studied history in college at American University, spent a lot of time on Latin American history. Um, got to know people like Bill Leo Grand, whose book with Peter Kornblu is now out, which is really, is, I, I haven't bought it yet, but it's, the reviews look good. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and my first visit to Cuba was actually in 1979, uh, as part of a trip from American University uh, to visit Cuba. We were there for three weeks. And it, um, and, and it was an incredible experience. You know, the Soviet Union was still around then. There was a big presence of Soviet presence in, in, uh, in Cuba at the time. Uh, we visited the Isle of Pines where the Cubans were uh, training Angolan soldiers. Um, there was a lot of, uh, lot of activity going on and, um, 
Uh, and, uh, but what my, my recollection of that visit was that Cuba was kind of as tight as a drum. I mean, there was, I mean, if you talk to a cab driver, he wouldn't, he wouldn't just open up and start talking about everything that, uh, that was going wrong with the system. People were pretty cautious. Now, in subsequent visits, as things began to change, um, you know, and I think as you have all have appreciated from your visits there, is that uh, things began to change in large part because of uh, the departure of the Russians and an influx of Europeans and Canadians and people from all over the world uh, and more investments uh, from, uh, from all over the world. Um, and it just became a, a very different place. And, um, and so when I worked for Joe Moakley, we, we, we spent, we made a couple of trips down there. Um, and in fact, uh, Moakley uh, brought a group of U.S. Uh, businessmen and women on a trip, which was pretty controversial. Clint was president, and some of the uh, some members of Congress were pretty upset about the trip um, and wanted uh, the administration not to give uh, Moakley a license to be able to ha to be able to conduct the trip. And I remember uh, Moakley had called Al Gore to say, you know, please don't screw around with this. I mean, this is important, uh, and I want to make this happen. And this. Uh, the Treasury Department, the State Department came over and they did a long interview with, with Congressman Moakley about what he was wanted to see and what he wanted to do there. And, uh, and it was all, you know, we wanted to meet with human rights activists, we wanted to meet with government officials, we wanted to visit all these, you know, the, the, the Cardinal, and went, went through a list of all the must-see uh, the, the must people. And at the end of the conversation, he said, you know, and, I, and, I, and, I, and maybe I'll, I'll go to a cigar factory. Um, and so we received our license on that trip um, in Miami right before we got on the charter flight to go to Havana. And the license basically regurgitated everything that Joe Moakley said he wanted to see. You were licensed to see all the, do all these different things. But then the last line in this license was that you could not go to the cigar factory, which <laughs> drove him insane. Um, and um, so, you know, we got off, we met the head, head of the U.S. intersection. He said, look, Look at this is crazy, you know. Can you believe that our government would do something like this? And we met with Fidel Castro. He said, "Look at this. This is crazy." Um, and um, and so the, the last day of the trip, uh, we had two buses. We had a lot of people with us. And he said, um, "I want to make an announcement. There's two buses: Bus A and Bus B. I'm going to be in Bus A. And I want everybody to know that Bus A will break down in front of the cigar factory if anybody wants to. <laughs> everybody crammed on Bus A." Um, but then I decided to run for Congress, um, and I was a long shot, uh, and nobody really gave me a chance to win, and so, uh, which was frustrating, but also very liberating, because when you have nothing to lose, you can say whatever you feel like saying. And so during the campaign in 1996, I talked a lot about a lot of different issues, but one of them was that you know, we ought to normalize relations with Cuba. The policy is a relic from the Cold War, doesn't make any sense. You know, we, we ought to do something about it. And uh, my opponent, uh, who's a two-term incumbent, thought I had just given him the greatest gift in the world um, and spent a lot of time filling people's mailboxes with all this propaganda that Jim McGovern is a friend of Fidel Castro's and all this kind of stuff. And he even had a guy who dressed up like Castro holding McGovern for a uh, Congress sign. And my local newspaper did a cartoon of Castro saying, you know, holding a McGovern sign saying, I didn't realize that the third district went all the way down to, Conne uh, to Havana. And, uh, but I won. Um, I, and, um, and a reporter asked me afterwards, you know, what I thought uh, now that the election was over. And I said, well, I, I, I guess what I've learned here is that Fidel Castro's approval rating in the second in the third congressional district is about five points higher than Newt Gingrich's because he was the speaker <laughs> at the time. Um, but you know, and, and and so and so when I got to Congress, you know, one of the things I tried to do was work with other members to try to figure out ways to move forward on legislation to lift the travel restrictions because I I, I think travel is important and I and I and and I, and I think it's undeniable. I mean, if you again visited Cuba. You know, in the 1970s, and you visited Cuba, you know, more recently, it is a, it is a different place. It's got lots of problems, but it's a, it's a different place. There is a lot more political space today. People say a lot more. That is not to minimize the human rights problems that still occur. It's just to state a fact. Uh, and, um, you know, and my view is that the more interaction between U.S. citizens and Cuban citizens, 
the more that political space continues to open up. In fact, most of the dissidents that I've met with over the years have all, while very critical of the Cuban government, have all said that our the U.S. policy um, actually hurts their cause. It doesn't help their cause and urged us to try to change it. You know, I, in preparing for this, this gathering here today, I, I went through some of my, my Cuba file and I came across an op-ed piece that I wrote for the Los Angeles Times on May 30th, 2000. And the, the, the title of the, of the piece was Clinton Should Board Air Force One to Cuba. And, and I said in the, in the piece, I'll just read you a couple of paragraphs, I said the president should fly on Air Force One into Jose Marti, Marti Airport in Havana and declare to the Cuban people that the Cold War is finally over. He should announce that he will use his executive power to normalize diplomatic relations, lift travel restrictions imposed on U.S. citizens who want to travel to Cuba, and waive as much of the outdated economic embargo as current law uh, um, allows. And I also go on to suggest that the only requirement that Clinton should impose on the Cuban government is that when he goes to Cuba, uh, that he should be allowed to speak freely and whatever he says should be televised uh, and uncensored. And, um, and I, I when this thing got published, Bob Novak did a piece in the Washington Post thinking that, you know, that I was, putting out a trial balloon on behalf of the Clinton administration that they really were trying to test this idea out to see whether or not uh, it would fly. The reality is I didn't check with anybody in the Clinton administration when I wrote this thing. I just did it because uh, I thought it was a good idea and hoped that they would react to it. And, uh, and I remember having, it, I, the, like the last month of the uh, Clinton presidency, I was at the White House for an event and I, I brought it this copy, the copy of the op-ed uh, with me, and I said, I don't, I don't know if you've seen this, but I want you to have it. I said, I really think you ought to go to Cuba before you leave office. I think you ought to change this policy. And what I remember about it, it was a very short conversation. He, he, um, he didn't dismiss it as wacky. He basically said, look, I don't have any more time. If I only had, if I only had more time, if I only have more time. Uh, and at that time, they were trying to work out a deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians, and he thought he could get a deal with North Korea. Um, and so, you know, in the last days, I, 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 think, I think this idea wasn't entertained, not because it was an idea that they found totally outlandish, but, but basically because there was no more time. And I'm not saying he would have done it before the election, um, but the bottom line is, um, you know, I thought there was a missed opportunity there. I thought we could have dramatically changed things. And then we had George Bush. And, uh, and, and, and the point I want to make here today is that, you know, in the United, in, 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 with regard to Congress, the situation to try to do anything on Cuba has worsened um, since I got elected to Congress. Um, in 1996 through 2000, uh, we had a lot of close votes. In fact, in the House, we actually passed uh, an amendment to, to uh, basic, essentially lift the travel restrictions. It would say that the United States couldn't use any funds and appropriations bills to enforce the travel restrictions, but it, it, it passed. Uh, and it passed by a, a, a pretty a good margin. It was uh, 232 to 186. Uh, we also, um, no, I'm sorry, it, it, yeah, we, yeah, that was, uh, and uh, we also passed another uh, bill, another, uh, another amendment that basically said that, uh, you know, that we couldn't use any uh, funds to uh, impose san any sanctions imposed by the United States on the sale of medicine, food, agricultural, and agricultural products to Cuba. And we actually had winning votes uh, on these things. They, they get defeated and derailed in conference committees and, you know, uh, and in negotiations with some in the Senate, but the majority of the House of Representatives wanted to see things change. Today, we couldn't get that vote. Today, on, on, the issue, on, the, on the vote on travel restrictions, uh, we would lose. We would lose. And we have kind of purposely not br been bringing that amendment up because we don't want to go backwards. We, you know, we want to build a momentum to be able to actually you know, be victorious. Uh, and we don't, we don't want to start demonstrating our weakness on this issue uh, you know, to, the, to those who are following this, this policy. So things have... Congress has, has become more reactionary on Cuba, um, not more open-minded. And, um, and so if there's any, any progress that's going to be made uh, in terms of changing our policy, it, it really is not going to come from the United States Congress. It's not going to come from the House of Representatives because we don't have the votes. It's probably not going to come from the United States Senate, not because I don't think they have 51 votes, but they don't have 60 votes. 
Uh, and as you know, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Menendez, uh, this is his number one issue. Uh, and, uh, and he makes it clear every time somebody tries to look at this issue a little bit differently, uh, that it will not be met with any enthusiasm in the Senate. He'll do everything he can to defeat it. And people ask me, well, what, what happened? Well, I think what happened is that for a lot of members of Congress, um, there are a lot of other issues out there. This is not the only issue. And even in terms of foreign policy issues, this may not be the most important. It's an issue that people have opinions on, but it's not the issue. For those who want to maintain the status quo or even tighten things up uh, in terms of sanctions, this is their big issue. For Senator Menendez, this is his big issue. For some of my colleagues in South Florida, this is their issue. Uh, it's not Medicare, it's not Social Security, it is Cuba. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, and I was thinking as I was walking here, to, walking into this uh, conference today, that, you know, not too long ago, having a conference like this might be viewed as somewhat controversial. Uh, but not anymore, with all the polls showing that the American people overwhelmingly want to change our policy, even Cuban Americans. The only place it's controversial is in the United States Congress. Um, you know, that's where t the kind of discussion that's going on today, um, you know, will be viewed, uh, you know, uh, w with not a lot of enthusiasm. And, um, and so if we're going to change anything, um, it is going to have to come from the administration. It is going to have to be uh, the administration acting within the authorities that it has to try to work around Helms-Burton. We're not going re to repeal Helms-Burton uh, anytime soon. I wish we could. Uh, but we're not. We don't have the votes. Um, and so there's a number of us, a bipartisan group of us, who have met with uh, a number of administration officials, um, everybody from the Secretary of State to the President of the United States, the Vice President of the United States, to his Chief of Staff, to his Security Advisors, every, anybody who we think might have some influence on kind of forging a new direction on Cuba. Um, and we've been listened to. Um, we've been told that you know, we're obviously sympathetic to what you're saying, um, and you know, we're be assured we're working on things. Uh, but in terms of what they're working on and who's working on it, I couldn't tell you. Um, and uh, so, you know, as, as we gather here today, I hope that there's somebody with some authority in the administration that's doing the kinds of things that I think would be really helpful, uh, you know, for U.S. to improve U.S.-Cuban relations. But I can't tell you, uh, you know, even based on the conversations other than uh, assurances that this is an issue that they still are working on, whether anything is being done. I hear rumors that maybe something might happen after the election. I don't know what's going to change between now and after the election. Um, the Senate might get worse. Um, the House might get worse. Um, but it's kind of irrelevant anyway to changing our policy in the short term because the only person who could really change that is the President of the United States. Um, and so I think he, he ought to figure out a way to kind of rip the bandage off and just do it. Uh, the majority of people in this country think that that would be the right thing to do. Uh, and, um, and let me just kind of close with this, and we can open up for discussion. Um, you know, this president has only two more years left. And so people say, well, you got two years, and you know, he still has time. He does, but you know, when you look back on the history of our of our policy toward Cuba, every time we get close to doing something good and positive, something bad happens. Um, and you know, we have Alan Gross in, pre in prison in Cuba. We have three Cubans in prison in the United States. Um, and quite frankly, they're complicating uh, negotiations and they're complicating kind of our ability to, to move forward. And so I think that any effort uh, to do something meaningful um, you know, we'll have to involve dealing with Mr. Gross and dealing with the Cuban Three. I don't know how you get around that. And um, I know Alan Gross is, I'm trying to think of the proper word, is pretty depressed being in prison. And I worry that, God forbid, anything happened to him. And I think that just freezes any chance of anything happening um, for the foreseeable future. Um, I don't think Alan Gross deserves to be in prison. I don't think the Cuban Three deserve to be in prison. Um, they're both victims of a Cold War policy, uh, a policy that is paranoid, 
uh, policy that is, you know, totally outrageous. And quite frankly, it's an embarrassment. Um, you know, um, the fact that we keep continue to put Cuba on the terrorist list it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, you, you can disagree with Cuba on a whole bunch of issues, but they don't belong on the terrorist list. Um, and the fact that they're on the terrorist list, I think, diminishes the importance of the terrorist list because it makes it look like a, a political document, you know, not something that is meaningful. Um, and the White House has the ability to be able to remove Cuba from the terrorist list. They ought to do it. The President ought to grant general licenses for everybody to travel to Cuba. Again, he ought to, he ought to you know, get his counsel in a room and go through step by step by step of, uh, of what he can do to open things up, to basically null and void Helms-Burton. I think the sooner he does it, the better. Um, and for those of us who care about human rights, and I co-chair co the Human Rights Commission, um, I think we have a better opportunity to promote human rights with a better relationship, with a more mature relationship. And I'll close with this. You know, I think both countries um, are to blame for this kind of crazy policy that exists, uh, because both countries do crazy things. I mean, I think, I think the way we talk about Cuba, um, you know, you would think that they're the most powerful, most influential country on the planet. Um, and, and the way Cubans sometimes react to, you know, things that we do here in the United States is so over the top that it, 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 it looks silly. It's unreasonable. Um, and, you know, I, I think, and, and, the, and the great example of this is if you go and you, uh, to Havana and you visit where the U.S. intersection was, and, you know, we put up this, like, ticker tape, you know, uh, sign that was, we, we were uh, brought, you know, that had news of what was going around in the world so the Cuban people could understand what was happening in the world, and the Cubans built flags to, you know, cover it up, and then we would have lifted up, the flags went higher. I mean, it's like, you know, we're the United States of America, you know, and I mean, and you know, in Cuba, you know, you're, and you're a sovereign country. I mean, this is crazy. This is not, this is, this is, this is a childlike. Um, but we need to move beyond that. And again, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I would say to, to President Obama, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to send him a copy of my, you know, my Clinton op-ed. Um, this is the time. This is the time. And, and, and I'll say, you know, it's a time because the President said when he was campaigning that he wanted to change our relationship. Uh, and I don't know who the next President's going to be. Uh, you know, if it's Hillary Clinton, she says she, she wants to improve relations with Cuba. But what if it's Ted Cruz or Mike Huckabee or, you know, there's so many interesting Republican candidates. I, I don't even know where to begin, to, to, you know. Um, but this is a moment, this is a moment that may be fleeting. And so we, we don't have a lot of time, uh, you know, and, um, and my hope is if the White House is thinking of doing anything, they ought to do it now. Um, and there is a bipartisan group in Congress, I think, that would stand with them, you know, and, and have their back uh, if they were to make a dramatic gesture in terms of changing our policy, and I hope that they do. So let me end there and open this up and talk about what Uh, yeah, in, in all of these discussions we've had with the different speakers, uh, it seems that missed opportunities are, are the underpin the entire history of between Cuba and the United States. And um, I've heard also said that, that one of the most dangerous things that can happen now in Cuba is that Raul would slip and fall in the bathtub and, uh, and die. And there's no sort of third in line. And, and I guess I, I wanted to hear from you a little bit more about how you feel if, if this becomes another one another opportunity we've lost? You know, what, 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 what do you feel could happen next? Well, I, I guess, you know, I don't know what happens after Raul. I mean, there's all kinds of speculation of who might, uh, who might be his successor. But, I mean, uh, I mean, the Castros seem to have a gene that allows them to live very long lives. Um, and, and, um, and when we met with Raul Castro, I, I think about a year ago, um, you know, I had one, um, a State Department official who said to me that if you, uh, that we heard he's, his health is not that great, will you let me know, um, you know, what your, what your impression is when you see him? And we met with him, 
in the Palace of the Revolution. It was a group of senators and a couple of members of Congress. And for three hours, we walked through various parts of the Palace of the Revolution while we, he tackled a whole bunch of questions on every subject you, you, want, to, uh, you want to think about. I think some, some in our delegation like needed oxygen by the time this <laughs> tour was over with, but he was in pretty good shape. But you never know. I mean, you never know. And that's why, I mean, I, I, it, it, I think the point you raise is, is a good point. You know, the history here is one of missed opportunities. And, you know, we have a moment right now where I think something meaningful could happen. I think we have a president who is sympathetic, who would like to do something. I think this is a, a legacy issue as well. Um, I think doing this, um, you know, uh, you know, would improve our standing in Latin America in general. Uh, we have the Summit of the Americas coming up, and God only knows how we're going to behave, uh, you know, uh, w when the Cubans show up. We're told that we will, we will show that we, we can live with it, but we're going to talk about human rights. I get it, but maybe we ought to take that opportunity to try to figure out a way to, you know, to break down some of the barriers so that if we have a concern about human rights, there are people that will actually listen and have an incentive to want to do something positive. Uh, so, so the stars seem to be aligned. But a number of things can happen. I mean, you know, Alan Gross's health, maybe Raul slips, you know, in the shower on a bar of soap, you know, um, you know, a, a number of things. Uh, but, but this is it. I mean, and I guess my advice to people here, um, if you have any connections in the administration, urge them to, to act, to be bold, to do something. This is, this is the moment. It will never get, you know, when, when they rip the bandage off and when we start changing our policy, you know, you, you know who the people who will complain are. We all know who they are. They're gonna, they complain anyway. Uh, but they don't represent the majority in this country. Uh, they don't represent the mainstream. And we've got to move beyond this. Uh, hi, Congressman. I'm probably the only one here who's from your district. Oh, they, oh hey. So, uh, or grew up in your district, so nice to see you. Nice <laughs> um, to see you. I wanted to ask you, I'd asked Greg Craig this yesterday and didn't really get an answer. And, you know, what we keep hearing from everyone is that this is the moment and the administration is interested. And, um, you know, we've been hearing this since at least 2009, 2008, and yet it doesn't happen. And I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more to sort of what the hurdles are, specifically. You know, we know who all these characters are. We don't need to name names in right. Congress who put up these hurdles. But what are they threatening? Like, what what are the things that they would do to the administration that they that they have or, you know, are promising to do if they do this? Yeah. So, you know, I think I think the concern is that you could get nominees that get stuck in committee um, in the Foreign Relations Committee. You could get um, resolutions that get passed uh, you know, over and over and over again. You know, condemning the decision. You could have riders attached to appropriations bills. You could have all kinds of mischief going on in, in conference committees and on the House floor and on the Senate floor. So, I mean, I, I think, look, I think part of the reluctance is that they know they'll get some significant pushback from some people who are in good, who are in pretty powerful positions. Um, and, as I said earlier, for those people who do not want to change the status quo, this is their issue. This is the most important issue to them. This is what they care most about. For the vast majority of us who believe we ought to change our policy and improve our policy, um, this, there are other issues we deal with. You know, um, you know I, I've had this conversation with the Chamber of Commerce. They believe we should have normal relations with Cuba. We should do more business with Cuba. I've been urging them to score this issue, you know, to actually give somebody, I, mean, I usually get like a negative 20 from the Chamber of Commerce, but you know, you know but some of these guys, if they don't get 100%, you know, they freak out. You know, score it. If you're not willing to co-sponsor a bill to say that we ought to, you know, lift the economic sanctions, then you get a, you get a negative sign, and you're, you don't get a perfect score. There ought to, there, you know, there's, you, you can be, you can be bad on this issue, and there's no political consequence. You can, and when you're good on this issue, um, you know there's no political, real political benefit. And I think, you know, and I'm not sure that that's going to change. Um, yeah, Chamber of Commerce wants to do business with Cuba, but you know, China's more important to them. You know, Russia's more important to them. 
You know, there are countries in, you know, Latin America that are more important. Trade agreements, all that kind of stuff takes precedent. But, um, but, it, it, you know, but, you know, for those of us who are trying to change this, you know, there are a lot of other issues that people are consumed with. And um, so, I, you know, I think the, the president has to make a decision whether or not he wants to do it um, and take the heat and, and, and do it because it's the right thing to do. Um, and at this point, quite frankly, you know what? Um, a fight with Congress might actually be good for his poll numbers. So, I, you know, I mean, that may not be a bad thing for him to do. Yeah, you've actually pretty much answered my question, but I just wanted to clarify that you meant that the majority of people in Congress were not hostile to Cuba, they're just passive, and the, those who, who are, are, inter are zealous about it are, are um, very reactionary. Uh, that is, I think, what you said, yes? Right. Yeah. And can you just explain a little bit more about this bipartisan committee? How big is it and who's on it? Well, we, 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 we had, we, for a while we had this Cuba working group that, uh, that met. It was a bipartisan group. It was about, you know, uh, maybe about 20 people or so that, uh, that met. The problem is a lot of the Republicans in the House that were really, that were good on this issue have now gone to the Senate. So like Jeff Flake, uh, Senator Bozeman of um, uh, Ar uh, Arkansas, right? Wait, wait, no, where the hell is he? Where is he? Arkansas, right, yeah. Um, Jerry Moran of Kansas. I mean, you, you know, when I, when I look at this vote that I mentioned before that we won in 2000, um, you know, th these guys were leaders on that issue on the Republican side. You know, they've all moved to the Senate. Um, some, of the replace some of their replacements are less sympathetic than, th than they were. Um, the other thing is that we had some, we, you know, uh, and I'll be honest with you, I think those of us who wanted better relations with Cuba got out organized by some members um, who, um, who raise money for incoming uh, congressional uh, c congressmen and congresswomen uh, during their campaigns. And, you know, one of the, one, you know, were very generous. And, it, you know, the one ask they had was, you know, you got to stand with me on the issue of Cuba. Uh, and, uh, and so, 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 so while the majority is, is kind of passive on this issue and, and you know, um, we don't, we, we, that, that pa passivity shouldn't be interpreted as that they would vote yes to improve relationship, relations if it came up for a vote. The problem is they're passive by and large, but, but we don't have a majority that would vote right now to lift the travel restrictions or to repeal Helms Burton or to do some of the things that, you know, are going to re be ultimately required to do, you know, to truly change our policy. The only hope we have in the near term is for the administration to take action. Um, and, um, and for those of us who have been working on this issue for a long time, we have, we have lobbied, we have worked them, we have talked to them, we have written them, we have done everything we possibly can to try to get this on their radar screen. Um, we're told that they're looking at this issue and that they're working on it. What that means, I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if tomorrow I picked up the newspaper and it was a big announcement. Nor would I be surprised if, you know, two years from now, nothing changes. Um, but uh, th th that's kind of where we are. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, my question comes out of the context of oh. your excellent work um, with the Jesuit massacre. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is an effective role for the Vatican and or interfaith coalitions in convincing President Obama that the time to act is now? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, think, I think, you know, I think it's important, but the Vatican over the years has been pretty clear about their view that our policy should change. You know, um, you know I was there uh, for the Pope's visit um, in 2000. It was, two, was 2000 or 19? 1998, 1998, um, and the Pope was pretty clear about, you know, the, the, uh, his views about our policy. The, uh, the Cardinal uh, in Cuba, Jaime Ortega, has been pretty, very, very clear about the fact that our policy um, is detrimental to average Cubans. Um, so high levels of the faith-based community have been weighing in, and they could, should continue to weigh in. Um, and, um, you know, and, and uh, but it, you know, it hasn't, 
it hasn't changed anything yet. Um, and it's yeah, yeah, you know, I, I I think they should continue to do it because I I, I think it, it it's added pressure and it keeps this issue on the radar screen. Um, but um, but look, the faith based community has been has weighed in on this. Quite some time. What we need is what we need is some. What we need is a little, a little more political pressure. You mentioned the Jesuits in El Salvador. When they were murdered, what the reason? One one of the one of the ways we we ended up winning on a vote to cut military aid to El Salvador uh, was because there was this incredible outpouring um, from all across the country of people saying we want you to stop arming this military, and. And, and, the, uh, and, and the Jesuit college presidents all across the United States played a very key role in organizing their alumni. I mean, it made a difference. It was effective. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't expect the Jesuit college presidents, you know, uh, right now to, to do this on Cuba. But the point of the matter is, uh, you know, there's not, to, 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 to vote for the status quo uh, there's, there's, there's not a lot of political gain. I mean, right now, there's no consequence um, for not being more reasonable on this issue. There just isn't. I'm not going to lose an election um, or, or win an election on Cuba. And, um, you know, because my constituents care about a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so I, I, I think the challenge here is to try to figure out a way to kind of build a political pressure uh, in a way that people feel that there's some political gain. You know, the, 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 the Cuban, uh, some of the Cuban exile community have been very good about, you know, f financing campaigns. We don't have a counter to that. There's no PAC out there. There's no kind of organization that funnels support PAC checks to candidates who say we want to normalize relations with Cuba. Um, and so there's, you know, I mean, there's, it's, it, yeah, I mean, it, up to, if, if, if the Pope's views were, you know, uh, if the Pope ha had the ultimate say in this, we would have changed our policy a long time ago. Hi. Does um, Cuba's rela relationship with Venezuela and its role in Venezuela have any impact whatsoever on the possibility of you know, improving relationships with, with Cuba? Yeah. You know what? I, th I think people will, will say that Cuba's relationship with Venezuela is, is problematic from, for, for some of the policymakers, but I, I really don't think so. I mean, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the reason why we're not moving on Cuba. I mean, uh, we, 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 we are locked into a Cold War mentality that we can't seem to shake. Um, these votes at the United Nations, where it's just us and Israel, you know, that vote against, uh, you know, condemning the embargo, overturning the embargo. I mean, you know, we are totally isolated. Um, and, um, and look, I want to say this, Cuba is actually playing a very positive role in the, in the uh, negotiations between the Colombian government and the FARC guerrillas. I mean, it's, a, it's an important role. I mean, there may actually be an agreement, a peace agreement in Colombia, and that would not be happening if it wasn't for the negotiations that are going on um, in Havana right now. And the Colombian government, which is our ally, you know, repeatedly reminds us how helpful the Cubans have been in this negotiation. Uh, and in fact, our, the Colombian government, our ally, has suggested that we revisit our policy toward Cuba. So, um, you know, I think I think people can come up with all kinds of excuses not to do anything, or, or they're involved. You know, the Cuba's too close to Venezuela, or Cuba's too close to this one or that one. I, I, you know, I, I think if all that ended tomorrow, that still wouldn't change anything. Um, you know, we, we I, I, you know, and I think, and I don't, I think one of the problems is in this country. I think we have a tough time admitting mistakes. And you know, this was a policy that was supposed to essentially overthrow the government of Cuba. You know, and um, you know, and then everybody would live happily ever after. Um, it, it just never happened. You know, and over five decades later, we're still talking about this same policy that has failed. After five decades, I think that's long enough time to be able to make a judgment as whether this is a, a good policy or a bad policy. Um, and 
I don't know anybody. I'll, I'll, be, I'll tell you, even during the Bush administration, when they were you know, very diff difficult to deal with on some of these issues, when you would talk to people in the State Department, the Treasury Department privately, they'd all tell you this policy is a joke. They'll realize that. I don't think there's any serious policymaker in any Democratic or Republican administration um, uh, in recent times that thought this policy was defensible. Um, this is a domestic uh, issue, more than a foreign policy issue uh, for Congress. And, you know, I, and again, I think uh, if we're going to change anything, it's going to be with, with, with the administration. Uh, I have a question, yeah. uh, Congressman McGovern. In your trip to Cuba, do you get any feedback or suggestion or a sense that the Cuban government will be um, willing to improve like human rights or give like kind of more space to opposition? What, what was your sense on, on, on that? So the Cuban government um, over the years has used our policy as an excuse to justify some of the more repressive policies that they have toward human rights. Um, you know, they point to our infiltration, you know, um, within the, you know, uh, in their society of supporting dissidents that want to overthrow the government that, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, and again, we can argue about what's, what's true and what's not true, but nonetheless, this policy gives people in Cuba, some of the hardliners, a convenient excuse not to change anything. Now, having said that, I don't think we would be honest um, if we didn't say that there is more political space in Cuba today than there was in 1979 when I first visited there. Th there is. Doesn't mean people aren't getting arrested um, for their for their views, but there's a lot more. There's a there, there's a there's a lot more there's a lot more political space. We we've had dissidents who have come up to Congress and then gone back to Cuba. Um, and, um, you know, and, and haven't been arrested. Um, many of those people, by the way, have come up and, and, and argued that, uh, you know, we ought to change our policy. The more that we can be there, the less repressive that they, that they will be. So, um, so my view is if we could Im improve relations, I, I think that's good for human rights. Um, you know, I, look, at, I, I co-chair the Human Rights Commission in the House of Representatives. I care deeply about human rights. I think everybody ought to have the right to say whatever they want and believe in whatever they want and question their government whenever they want to do it. So when anybody cracks down on people who I think exercise what I think is a fundamental human right, uh, you know, to be able to express themselves, um, I don't care whether it's in Cuba or anywhere else in the world, you know, I think that ought to be condemned. But, you know, uh, when, when, when people use human rights, that Cuba doesn't have a, a, a perfect human rights record or that there's still problems in Cuba as an excuse not to move forward. I mean, we, 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 most of our allies have worse human rights records than Cuba. I mean, um, you, you had 40, what, over 40 students, um, you know, massacred in Mexico. Um, you, 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 Colombia, one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a trade unionist. Um, and you know, I don't like to get into comparisons of numbers, but I'm just simply saying that you know, let's let, let's let's be honest here. Uh, when the, when previous administrations pushed um, better trade relations with China, one of the things that they emphasized over and over and over again was more trade and more contact uh, with the Chinese people will help open political space and, and be better for human rights in the long in the long term. So um, you know, I, I don't know what makes Cuba different from China. Um, or from Russia, or from a whole bunch of other countries that we deal with. But uh, again, that's, that's why I think our, our policy has become such an embarrassment, because it just doesn't make any sense. We seem to have a double standard here. Peter's had the Congressman, for a while there. Oh, Congressman, please. thank you for coming. You've been uh, extremely candid and direct about the issue of the Cuban spies and Alan Gross. Um, and I'm wondering if you would take the opportunity to walk us through the politics of uh, some kind of humanitarian exchange given that we've just watched the administration go through kind of a big, big pushback on the release of this soldier for the Taliban. And, and, and even more interestingly, I think for those of us watching this, the, the trial balloon about releasing Jonathan Pollard uh, uh, to get the Israeli-Palestinian talks going and the intelligence community's response to that. Well, look, I mean, in, in the, especially in the aftermath of the Bergdahl um, uh, release uh, and, and, the, and the exchange that happened there. 
Um, I think the administration probably is a little more sensitive, uh, a little uh, more so than they than they were before before that happened about any kind of exchanges. Um, I think the problem with the Bergdahl uh, exchange was that people were kind of caught off guard. I mean, there is a case to be made that you can do something, a humanitarian exchange, um, and whatever form it takes, you know, I, I, you know that. I mean, there's a number of ways they could approach it. But I, but, I, but I think, you know, making sure that people are informed, that, uh, that they know that this is a possibility. You know, getting the kind of congressional ducks in line that if they were to do something dramatic, um, that they would have some support. Not that, I, you know, not having people say, I didn't know anything about it, this came out of the blue. I think it's important, for, you know, for, for uh, you know, people, especially people who are sympathetic, uh, to be engaged. But I, I guess, you know, um, to me, the importance of of any of dealing with Alan Gross and the Cuban Three is not just that I don't think they deserve to be in jail, um, but I think it's kind of right now a, a, a blockade that makes it difficult for the administration to engage on any other issues as well. Um, you know, any kind of dramatic issues or you know, granting a general license to everybody. I mean, I think it's it just, it just there. It's, 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 it, it, it needs to be dealt with. And, um, you know, and, and, I, and but, I, but, but look, I mean, the one thing I, the one thing I worry about, and I, I said this earlier, um, is that we don't know what could happen to any of these people. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Alan Gross said that this is the last year he's going to spend in a Cuban prison. I, you know, I mean, we can interpret that whatever way we want to, but, you know, if something happens to him, I think it makes it much more complicated, much more difficult. And then there's no exchange. There's nothing to exchange. Um, and, you know, and, and, and maybe it's not just a simple exchange. Maybe there's more on the, maybe there's more demands on the table in terms of how we can move the, our, our, our policy forward. But, um, I think this is different from the Bergdahl situation. Um, and I'll tell you, when we met with Raul Castro the last a couple of times, a year and a half ago, um, he made it very clear to me about the, the Cubans that were in jail. He said that, uh, you know, you're holding them responsible for our shooting down of, the, uh, of, of those planes. He said, I gave the order. I gave the order. Um, you know, that was my decision. And, um, you know, and you know, and I think that you know we worry about public opinion here in the United States. There is such a thing as public opinion in Cuba as well. Um, and um, for those people who have followed Cuba for a long time, you know, public opinion in Cuba doesn't always reflect what American politicians say public opinion in Cuba is. And I think that um, you know, I think that for a lot of Cubans, um, you know. The, the, the continued um, jailing of, of the remaining those three Cuba, uh, the three Cubans that are in jail, I think is uh, I think is a uh, is a pretty raw issue down there. Um, but look, the president of the United States doesn't have to run for re-election. There's no more campaigns. So, I mean, I mean, if we're worried about campaign, you know what? Congress couldn't be more rotten to them than they are now. I mean, I mean, it's just everything. You know, it's just there's no. So when you say, well, you say, well, he'll take more heat, God, you know, um, th on this issue, I think you could take the heat and the American people will actually be with you. Um, and you, you, ought, you ought to do it. And, um, and that is going to probably have to deal, that's going to have to also focus on how you resolve the issue of Alan Gross and the, and the three Cubans. Let's do a couple more questions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a brief comment and a question. Sure. Um, there is a fundamental difference between the Chinese or China situation and Cuba. We Cubans uh, imagine our dismay after, as you are tired of a failure of a politics, uh, of embargo during so many decades, imagine the dismay of a pe whole people tired of not having a country with congressmen and congresswomen, a country full of Jim McGovern's and Marco Rubio's and, and liberals and democrats and, and only dealing with the same autocratic vertical model of the stagnation of time, no? 
Jim McGovern traveling to Cuba, talking to the same person that a, Senate, a congressman or whatever would be traveling, talking to Cuba today. So it's like a, a dismay, and please understand the, the disappointment no? of a whole people. And indeed, we are trying to find ways to move on. I don't know with embargo, without embargo, but uh, trying to, f to, to create a country, not only with um, free markets or more uh, in engagement, but also with fundamental freedom. So in many, many senses, Cuba belongs to the Western orbit, no? And not to the orbit of autocratic and, and despotic tradition. And my question is, uh, don't you, uh, after you have well, so well explained that everything, some, everything sh things are about to change, usually with, under democrats' administration, something terrible, the, the terrible hazard happens, somebody dies, there is a boat leave crisis, somebody's in jail. Don't you think that, as you have, are explaining, all this approach to the Cuban government somehow scares uh, that the Cuban uh, government because they understand, as you understand, that engagement with the United States will involve democratization sooner or later with, uh, of the society and somehow they have to run away at the same time claiming to be the big team? And, and do you think that could be some intentionality uh, with the enemy, in this case the, the Cuban regime, or this is just hazard that is working against Cubans? Or, I, mean, I, I, think you're, I think, you know, your point is, is very valid. I think there are hardliners in the Cuban government who, who do not want things to change because it is not in their interest for things to change. They, they, will may, they may lose some power. You know, the system may change in a way that they don't like. Um, so I do, I think there are people who are very, there are hardliners in Cuba who are very nervous about any kind of, uh, any kind of change. But I also believe this, you know, um, you know, we have, when we talk about Cuba and the United States, we have this tendency to say, well, this is what should happen in Cuba, and they should do this, and they should do this, and they should do this. My view is that the future of Cuba ought to be determined by the Cuban people, not, not by the United States Congress, and not by people in Miami, not by people in Massachusetts, not by people. The Cubans ought to be able to determine their own, their own fate. Um, what, I, what, what I believe is that if we had a different, more mature relationship, I think they would, it would open more space for a dissent, more dissenting views. Um, I think it would, it, it, would, it would, I think, result in more creativity and, and, um, and ways to deal with the economy and to deal with politics in Cuba that I think would, would, would be beneficial to people who want to move toward democratic reforms. But ultimately, what happens in Cuba ought to be determined by, by the Cubans and ought not to be determined by Washington. And I think we have a tendency here to think that, um, you know, we know th the best way to do everything. We have the answers to everything. And when we tell you, whatever country you may be, to do X, Y, and Z, you ought to do X, Y, and Z. You know, my, my view is individual people, people in those individual countries ought to make their own decisions. Um, and I know it's difficult, and, you know, and uh, especially when you're trying to change a system like that. But uh, what, what, what Cuba looks like in the long term um, is not something that, you know, should be, you know, that, that, we, re, that we, we require the Cuba look like, you know, you know, the United States of America by, uh, you know, in order for us to change our policy. It's up to the Cubans to decide what they want. And let me tell you, one of the things I've learned, it's complicated. So you get Cubans who, who, who say things like, well, you know, I, 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 I'm very upset about, you know, the, the crackdowns on free political expression. But they also say, you know, we want to, we, we, we don't want, we want to pr pr uh, protect the best of the revolution. We want to protect, we, we, they like, you know, they, they think importance of education and health care and some of those things are, are very, very, they want to protect that. Um, so, you know, Cubans could decide what they want to do. I'm just simply saying that our policy doesn't make sense no matter how you want to look at it. Two more questions right. and then uh, I may take chair's privilege. Hi, Mr. McGovern. Oh, there you I was just curious about your pos position with closing down Gitmo, given you know the human rights abuses that go on in Cuba. Um, the optics don't look good with this sort of torture camp that right. we have there. Yeah, I think we should. I think we should close down Guantanamo. I mean, I, I think that, I think I think it is. A, I think uh, I think what ha what's ha what happened at that base is. Uh, you know, is a, is a terrible blemish on our, our human rights record. And, um, and look, and we are not perfect when it comes to human rights either. Um, and, um, and, you know, and I think the fact that the United States government was involved 
in any way, shape, or form with uh, tolerating torture. Um, I don't care who it is. Um, I, I think is outrageous. I think I, I think it, I, I personally believe it's illegal. But um, uh, but I, I you know I mean I but I do you know so I mean I it. it I understand the contradiction, but our, our, our policy is, is nothing but a bunch of contradictions. Again, I mean, if, if you're going to complain about the human rights situation in Cuba, and uh, we have some very good allies, uh, including one, I, mean, I, I, I do, we just did a hearing on Bahrain, all right? Uh, they're one of our coalition partners in this latest uh, Iraq, uh, Syria, ISIS uh, adventure that we're now involved in right now. Um, you know, they're not only cracking down on, um, on political dissent, they're arresting political opposition leaders. And they're our ally, and we are praising them every day in the newspaper and every day on the television news. So, um, you know, I, I, I wish our human rights policy were more consistent um, and more, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, and that we didn't pick and choose who we, who, who we wanted to talk about human rights with and who we didn't. Uh, but, you know, that's another one of the contradictions. But I do think, you know, what, what I, if I, I always vote to shut down the, the base, and I think the president wants to do that. I give him credit for doing it, but Congress won't let him. I mean. One more. Oh, hi. Um, so we've covered the fact that much more resources and energy goes into propping up the embargo politically than does into trying to end it. Okay. Um, that the church is not going to be this, you know, where it comes from. It's not going to happen in Congress. If, if you weren't a congressman and someone gave you a whole bunch of money, what would you do with it to try to move the needle? I mean, Atlantic Philanthropies is, is investing in this. Look, there are a lot of organizations here that do really good work. Um, and, um, and, and, I, and I think that um, to the extent that we can get more and more allies in the effort to, to change our policy, a lot of it depends on some of the good work that's being done by a lot of the organizations. And quite frankly, a lot of the re, uh, reports that are filed by some of the, a lot of the reporters here. Um, but I, I would, at this particular point, my focus would be on using that money to find ways to pressure the administration to move. Um, and if I were designing a campaign, I'd be looking at, you know, who are their, who are, who are their biggest supporters? You know, who are, who, who are the people that uh, Obama and Kerry and, um, um, uh, and, and anyone else who has the chief of staff, who, who do they listen to the most? I would, I would, I would be doing a very kind of calculated campaign focused on the administration. Because if there's any change, it is going to come from the administration. Um, and uh, so kind of raising the pressure on the powers that be in the administration, I think at this particular point, would, would be very, very helpful. That's where I would focus. And. Um, and again, in providing and supporting the organizations that provide members of Congress with the basic facts and the realities of what's happening in Cuba. Let me just close with one thing. For 11 years, I've been working on a project um, to protect and preserve Ernest Hemingway's house in Cuba and all of his contents and all of the writings. And I got involved in this because Max Perkins, who is Hemingway's editor, granddaughter, lives in Massachusetts, and we got involved in this thing. And over, over a period of 11 years, if, I don't know if you, when the last time any of you have been to the Finca Vajia, but over the, la, over the last 11 years, that place has basically kind of come alive again. We have worked with various organizations to protect documents that were crumbling. We're protecting books, protecting the house, protecting his boat, and everything else. I'm really proud of that project. It took, a, it, it, and we've been doing this for 11 years, what we did in 11 years could have been done in a year if we didn't have all these stupid rules. Every single piece of paper that we had to bring down had to be licensed. Um, I mean, everything. We, we're now talking about building what they call a taillere, which, which is a workplace. You know, we're having discussions with, with the Department of Treasury and the State Department that maybe we will buy the wood here, and we'll buy the cement in the United States, and we'll buy the nails, and, and then we'll apply for a license so we can then spend money to ship all this stuff down, you know, and help them build this taillere. It's crazy. It's just crazy, you know. And when you think about, in this case, Ernest Hemingway, you know, I mean, 
I, I didn't, you know, what's the big deal? I mean, he's an, you know, an American icon. He's an icon in Cuba. You know, I mean, we, we, we care about culture. We care about preserving historical sites. Why is this so difficult? And, you know, I, I, I just, I close with that just because it just points out the insanity of this policy. Um, and I think if the, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful that the president will do the right thing. I, I, I have to be hopeful. Other, other, either, other, or I have to change my prescription drugs. I don't know why. But I mean, <laughs> but I, I got to be hopeful here. And I think any pressure on this administration to urge them to do the right thing, I think, would, would be very helpful. What's, I'm going to close with, by picking up on something related to this that you said at the beginning, and that relates to a sort of a colloquy we had yesterday. What is your view of how far the president can go to effectively nullify Helms-Burton? Can he grant himself a national security waiver to the whole thing? Does he chip away bits and pieces? What's your view of where Helms-Burton fits into this? Yeah, well, look, you know, Helms-Burton is, is problematic because it's, it's law. Uh, but the president has the authority to waive, a, or, to waive or, or maybe ignore, I don't know what the right word is, you know, big chunks of it. I, I mentioned the travel stuff. He could grant general licenses to everybody to, to go down and travel so that e even though the, technically the law hasn't changed, I mean, his interpretation of the law is such that, you know, everybody can go. Um, I mean, there's, there, I, I think there are lots of creative things that he can do. I mean, there's, there are lots of, some of the groups that are here have done detailed analyses of all the, all the different things that, uh, that he can do uh, through, through executive order. Um, and my hope is he'll do it. I mean, you, you can, uh, he can do enough so that I think it will ultimately lead to Congress at some point, maybe not in the next couple of years, but at some point, uh, overturning all of Helms Burton because it won't, won't make any sense anymore. I mean, he can, he can, he can neuter that bill, uh, that law pretty, pretty substantially. And so, um, so that's the hoe. I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's where, you know, the, that's, that's the only place where I can see any positive action happening um, in terms of our policy. And, um, and again, I, 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 you know, I, we're, we're reassured that this is an issue that they care deeply about. We're reassured that they're working on it. But no one has told me that, you know, Secretary so-and-so is on the phone with, you know, Minister so-and-so in Cuba, and they're having discussions. I, you know, I, I take them at their word that, pe that people are thinking about that, and I hope that they move quickly because, um, again, I think this moment could be fleeting, and I don't, I, I don't want to come to this conference 10 years from now, you know, and say, you know, how do we change our policy toward Cuba? We just ought to do it. Okay. Good place to stop. Thank you. Thank you.